The Lone Star State is celebrating its 150th birthday. Yes, it's been a century and a half since those Conestoga wagons first covered the plains. Bringing pioneer farmers in search of land to develop. Ranchers seeking those legendary longhorns and would-be barons thirsty for Texas tea. The founding fathers, men like Stephen F. Austin, Davy Crockett, and Sam Houston, left a legacy that's larger than life. Hollywood Cowboys and Washington Chiefs, country heroes and fast-talking villains. And now, once again, the spirit of the Wild West comes to life deep in the heart of Texas. It's tournament time, and 64 teams from around the country are vying to horn in on the ultimate Texas-style shootout three weeks down the road. Destination, Dallas. Hitch up your saddles and come along for the ride as we head out on the road to the Final Four. Hello again, everybody. I'm Brent Musburger, my partner. Along the road to the Final Four is our CBS Sports College basketball expert, Billy Packer. And, uh, Brent? Billy, a different feeling coming into this tournament. Well, Brent, we've been chasing the UCLA's through the 60s and the 70s, and then the Elijah Wands and the Ewings and the Sampsons in the late 70s, 80s. Uh, right now, we don't have a team that everybody says, hey, if you don't beat them, you're, you're out of the tournament. We've got a lot of very good basketball teams, a lot of teams, I think, when we get down to the Final 16, that are really going to play some competitive ball games. All right. Now, as I've mentioned, we are just six hours away from the first official announcement of the tournament field, the seedings, and all of those opening round pairings. And still ahead of us here on the road to the Final Four, we are going to take a look at some of the unsung squads likely to make the tournament more lively in their roles as this year's long shots. in Philadelphia, we'll show you why St. Joe's is flying high on the wings of a glorious past. And down south, the bear is not forgotten, but there's a new game bridging the gap between football seasons. At USC, Cheryl Miller hopes to bow out on top. Out in the Midwest, Bradley's been on top all season long, yet despite those wins... No respect. No respect. And we'll start our search for long shots out west with a look at the big guns in the Pac-10 when we continue here on CBS. The Road to the Final Four is sponsored by... The U.S. Armed Forces, it's a great place to start. MasterCard, MasterCard International, master the possibilities. And by Isuzu Quality Cars and Trucks. Isuzu, the first car builders of Japan. The West, once it was America's oasis of college basketball, but there's been a long dry spell since the great John Wooden era at UCLA. Since that time, the Pac-8 became the Pac-10 with the inclusion of a pair of Arizona schools. And now one of them, the University of Arizona Wildcats, is gearing up to settle some old scores. Our Gary Bender lives in Arizona, and he's seen these tough cats prowl. They're coming from the Wild West, from the desert, where only the strong survive. They're fast, they're mean, they're hungry. They have only one thing in mind, only one mission at hand. The Wildcats are out to prove they're the fastest gun in the West. They're in the midst of their finest season in modern times. They've already won 23 games. They've captured their first Pac-10 title ever and clinched an NCAA tournament bid. A far cry from three short years ago when they were outgunned almost every time. 
It was the 1983 season, Ben Lindsay in his only season as head coach, and the Wildcats staggered to a 4-24 record in last place in the Pac-10. The Wildcats needed a change desperately, and so they went out and hired a coach to restore order. Cool hand Lute, Lute Olsen of Iowa. Olsen coached the Hawkeyes to 20 victories six times and won the Eastern Regional Championship in 1980 on the way to the Final Four. When the call came from Arizona, Olsen's decision was easy. I enjoy the climate. I wanted the challenge of building this thing up, and uh, uh, we were, we had spent 12 years in the West, and we really liked the West. So Olson went West and built Arizona into a winner, from worst to first in just three seasons. Steve Kerr won all conference honors at guard, and he's the leader of the Wildcats. Freshman Sean Elliott is a budding superstar, but Arizona's a team whose overall success far exceeds individual accomplishments. This team here at Arizona has been extremely close, and I think uh, the chemistry has, has been critical to us. Uh, and it's, it's probably the most personable group of kids I've ever been around. I mean, every day is a blast. Because we're just really closely knit. It's, it's like one big family, you know, knowing have all these little nice guys hanging around with you and everything. Oh, but see, we're nice off the court, but on the court, we're, we're mean. We're some snakes. <laughs> But these Wildcats weren't born with that killer instinct. They had to learn it. Last season, Arizona played in the NCAA tournament for the first time in eight years, but were bounced in the first round by Alabama. After a taste of success, the players want more. It's a different feeling from last year. Last year, we were just happy to be there in the tournament. But this year, I think we're, we're, not, we're not thinking that way. We're thinking, you know, we're going to go in and get some wins. Arizona will need more than a few wins to reach the Final Four. They'll need to make a little history along the way. Not since UCLA captured its last national title in 1975 has a Pac-10 team won it all. In fact, since 1980, things have been so dry out west that the top seeds have usually been transplanted from the east. When people are they're constantly knocking the Pac-10, they're saying that it's a down year for them and, and this and that. But, um, I think that we can really go out and we can show people that we can play with anybody. And uh, we have that kind of confidence, too. We want somebody big. We want to play a uh, powerhouse, and we want to show people that we can play with them or, you know, uh, show people that they can't play with us. <laughs> Lute Olson's Wildcats back up their tough talk with tough play. Two weeks ago, at the Pac-10 lead up for grabs, Arizona defeated Washington and Washington State to take sole possession of first place and set up a showdown with UCLA. When we did beat Washington, we knew that we, you know, had, we still had a little ways to go because uh, we we're, were, like, tied up then at that moment. And um, we had to go into Poly thinking, that we could win because, you know, we did not win up there last year and Coach hasn't won up there since he's been, you know, coaching. Early on, it appeared the UCLA home court hex still held its magic over Olsen and the Wildcats. Reggie Miller poured in 21 first-half points to give UCLA the lead. But the Wildcats proved they have a champion's heart and dominated the second half, rolling to an 88-76 victory to clinch the first Pac-10 basketball title in Arizona history. came out and they played really, really hard. You could see it. They had fire in their eyes, but um, old Arizona spirit prevailed. We were definitely excited. You know, this is the first time Arizona's won a, a Pac-10 title in any sport, and um, that's a, a big achievement, and we were real proud of ourselves. <laughs> For Arizona, next stop, the NCAA tournament. Final destination, Dallas, Texas. Billy, how long will it be before the Pac-10 climbs back in there with the Big Ten and the ACC and the Big East? Well, I don't know when that day is going to come, Brent, but I like what the Pac-10 is doing in regard to the coaching changes that have been made out there. They're starting to get a lot of good young basketball players. Pooh Richardson coming from east to west is going to help, and of course, a guy like Sean Elliott's one of the premier freshmen in the country. I think that they're making their move now to turn this thing around. Well, we're going to check in momentarily on the teams that have already qualified from the West region, take a look at Billy's list of probables and on the fence. But first, we want to get an overview, and we want to go out live to Kansas City because our Gary Bender is standing by with Dick Schultz, the athletic director of the University of Virginia, and he is the chairman of the NCAA Selection Committee. So let's go to Gary. Brent, thank you very much. We have, of course, the focal point here. This is our headquarters in the Western Crown Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and the chairman of the Selection Committee, Dick Schultz, the athletic director at the University of Virginia. 
this evening. Gary Bender will be back live from Kansas City, and he will tell us the 64 team field and where everybody is going. Now let's take everybody back, Billy, into the West, and here are the teams from the West region, which now includes the Southwest Conference, that have already qualified. Arizona, of course, we've heard all about the Wildcats here this afternoon. Pepperdine, UNLV, and Montana State upset Montana last night to qualify for the tournament. And Texas El Paso, always well-coached team, they'll be in the 64-team field. And Northeast Louisiana, also in the field. Now, how about your probables? Well, of course, I'm not in that committee room, and obviously they're all done right now. But even though the West ha has been increased from a geographical standpoint, Brent, I don't think that they have teams other than those that we showed right there that are probables, that are guaranteed to be on in there. But you've got some on the fence? I think there's some on the fence, and I think it's been kind of interesting what's happened out, and particularly in the Pac-10. They had four teams last year in the NCAA tournament. I think TCU's on the fence. The West, Washington and California have been a battle all year. California beating them last night in overtime. And Utah, they have 20 wins. I think that they could uh, sneak on in there. And when we continue, we'll head back east for a look at the long shot from the city of brotherly love. We'll see if St. Joseph's of Philadelphia can achieve what the Loyola Ramblers did back in 1963. <laughs> Philadelphia. This is where our nation's founding fathers dared to declare their independence from Great Britain. And you might say the upstart colonists were heavy underdogs against the mighty royal empire. College basketball in Philadelphia also has a rich, rich heritage, and in a town that loves a long shot, our Bill Raftery gives the nod to old St. Joe's. I think that they have a passion for the game, and I just think you're de not dealing with an awful big school here, but I think you're dealing with a school where basketball is a very important part of the, of the community, and because of that, you're dealing with a situation where, where, where the people who play here have a feeling for that, and they, they have a sense that you can achieve, you can overachieve and be successful. And success has surrounded the St. Joseph's Hawks again this season. A conference title and an NCAA tournament berth. Ten seasons ago, Sports Illustrated thought the Hawks would be so successful, they ranked them number one. For 75 seasons, St. Joe's has had its share of success, but it's never come easy. It was known that St. Joe's would never be out hustled on the basketball floor. So the players all gave 100%, uh, even against teams with... Uh, more skilled players, teams with better records. They knew they were in a dogfight when they played St. Joseph's. That was crystal clear in 81, when number one ranked DePaul played St. Joe's in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. The Blue Demons had the talent, led by Mark Aguirre, and they had the lead with just 12 seconds to play, with a chance to ice the game at the free throw line. Oh my, look at this! St. Joseph has the ball back! Seven seconds. Look at this. Look at this. Yes. They win. Oh, they oh, just win. Is. For head coach Jim Lineham and the Hawks, the biggest win in the St. Joe's history. St. Joseph's has been in 13 NCAAs, and the most exciting moment ever may have been when Jimmy Lineham led the Hawks over the Blue Demons of DePaul for 75 years and over a thousand wins. St. Joe's has been the Cinderella of college basketball. I should know, I played at LaSalle here in Philadelphia where they beat people on a regular basis during my four years. With only 2,400 students, how have the Hawks done it? Simply with outstanding coaches. Jack Ramsey learned the game here from the legendary Bill Ferguson. But Ramsey, the St. Joe's coach, started an amazing string of his own. He taught a young athlete named Jack McKinney, who later replaced him as coach before moving up to the NBA's L.A. Lakers. McKinney's replacement with the Lakers, Paul Westhead, was another St. Joe's player under Ramsey. But it didn't stop there. Ramsey was my coach. Jack McKinney was the assistant when I was a senior in college. Jimmy Lynham was a sophomore, and Jim Boyle, the current coach, was a freshman. So there was a, there was a whole pecking order that was da -da 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 -da. And when Matty Gukas was picked to coach the 76ers this year, it was a homecoming for the former star of the St. Joe Hawks of the mid-60s. But Gukas wasn't even the first Hawk All-American in his family. Matt Sr. beat him to that. 
Through both generations, though, the St. Joe's style of play didn't change. Well, I think it goes back, uh, maybe even back to my father's day. Uh, they were known as a small team, the Mighty Mites, and uh, I guess on a number of occasions were able to be bigger, stronger, more talented teams. Uh, and that carried on for a while. And then when Jack Ramsey came, too, uh, it always seemed like the Hawks were the underdogs against uh, uh, some of the better teams in the country, but were still able to come out on top uh, once in a while. And through the generations, the Hawk mascot has been flapping its wings from the start of every game to the final buzzer. It's both an honor and a great responsibility. Well, the motto with the, the Hawks, you know, it's like a scrappy team. They say the Hawk will never die. And, uh, you know, the flapping the wings symbolizes, you know, us, if I stop flapping, the, hawk, the Hawk's dead, you know, on the floor, not coming back, that kind of stuff. This year's St. Joe's leader on the basketball floor is number 11, Maurice Martin. He's a senior, and he's got all the moves of a probable first-round NBA pick. Thanks to St. Joe's, he's got even more than that. I knew that this, this was a school where a great coach you were from, and, you know, you can really learn a lot from being at a situation like this. I mean, you can just develop your total game from, from a school such as this. Martin and teammates shaved heads to inspire a big win over Villanova early this year. And with the season-long improvement of big man Rodney Blake, another DePaul-type tournament upset is a distinct possibility. The Hawks and coach Jim Boyle are aiming high. So we've played against good teams, and we've won uh, against good teams. Uh, we'd like to play Duke. They, they thumped us early in the year, and if we had the opportunity to play one team, uh, We'd like another crack at Duke. Jim Boyle was a player on a team that went to the tournament, and a tough, talented guard by the name of Billy Packer took them out with that Wake Forest team. Well, we took them out one year, but St. Joe's went all the way to the Final Four under Ramsey the year before at 61, a tough year for college basketball. The year of the scandal kind of wiped away some of that great tradition, but it's always been a super school for basketball, Brent. Billy, let's take a look at the teams from the East region that have already qualified for the 64-team field. St. Joe's, of course, is there along with St. John's, and they won in such dramatic fashion last night in the Big East over the Pearl, Dwayne Washington and Jim Beheim. It is worth a second look. The Pearl simply did not disappoint. 14 assists, 20 points overall. He gave the Orangemen an 11-point halftime lead. It grew to 13 in the second half. St. John's and Louis Karnasek never led until the final closing seconds. Ron Rowan, the transfer from Notre Dame, hit the jump shot, and then the pearl was coming. St. John's knew who it would be, and Walter Berry said, I knew it was gonna come down to me, and with his left hand, he swatted it away, and Louis Carnesecca had his Big East championship. And for the losers, well, they'll regroup, because certainly Syracuse will be in the 64-team field announced later today. We come back, we're going to check in on the other Final Four, the NCAA Women's Tournament, and we'll find out if they can provide the type of long shot heroics that North Carolina State generated with their upset of Houston back in Alabama fans, the tide is starting to turn toward the school's winning team without the shoulder pads. And James Brown profiles a long shot from college basketball's New South. When the Southeastern Conference season began, attention was focused on Auburn's Sonny Smith and Chuck Person, the arrival of Eddie Sutton at fabled Kentucky, and the controversy surrounding LSU and Dale Brown. Alabama, well, at least they'd had a nice football season. You know, I... Football in Alabama is football, and uh, this is football country, let's face it. But wait, they do play basketball here, and if Wimp Sanderson's team seems overshadowed, well, that's really nothing new. The Crimson Tide stands for one thing above all others, and as long as they play games here, that's probably the way it will always be. What other team in the SEC has won at least 20 games for the last five years? What other team has been to five consecutive NCAA tournaments? What other team has beaten Kentucky in Rupp Arena for the SEC championship other than Alabama? All under Wimp Sanderson. And yet when you think of Alabama, what do you think of? You think of Alabama football. 
while you might think of football, and where football is very big here, I think basketball has become um, a real big sport. As loyal as the Bear was to football, that's how loyal Winfrey Sanderson's been to Tide basketball. He came here in 1960 for $75 a month and spent 20 years as an assistant before becoming the top man just six years ago. But he was born for the job. He has the heart of a bear. Oh, I, I really hate to lose. I can remember my junior year in high school that uh, I, made a sh I made a shot to come to the state tournament, which was important to me. I fouled a guy my senior year to knock us out of a chance to come to the state tournament. It took me months to get over that. I still think about that today. People were used to a low-key approach in basketball and putting most of their eggs into the football basket. And Wimp wasn't like that. And he would play to win. He doesn't like to lose. And he would rub people the wrong way that wanted a nice winter sport between fall football and spring football. You might say under Wimp, basketball has become a right nice winter sport. He's just so into coaching and, and, and getting this point across over to you that you're going to listen and you're going to pay attention and uh, you're going to most of the time do what he wants you to do. When Buck missed four games with an injured thigh, Wimp's guys didn't whimper. They just hit the boards a little harder, pulled together a little tighter. Sophomore Derek McKee matured and their three-guard offense, led by Terry Connor and Mark Gottfried, really gelled. This basketball team has been a team of overachievers. They wanted to show me that they were a better basketball team than I had given them credit for being, and that the fifth place finish that they were selected uh, to have was not going to come true. They've got a good chance to maybe reach the Final Four this year. Maybe we can go to the Nationals and win it all. Finally, Wimp Sanderson is getting a lot of the credit that he deserves, and rightfully so. And I'm, uh, I'm right up at the front row. Sweet rewards, like this one Wimp just received from his peers. And maybe one day on this Tuscaloosa campus, they'll name a boulevard after him. No matter, though, for the years have been well spent. Alabama's special, I guess, to me because it's home. It's been a situation where nobody knew a great deal about basketball, yet we've worked so hard and traveled so many miles to take something that was an infant and try to make it grow into something that's uh, now, I think, uh, universally known and so it's been a thrill in, in building a basketball program out in the midwest everyone wishes they were in peoria everyone except opposing college basketball teams for peoria illinois is the home of bradley university and as doug collins tells us this is the home of one of college basketball's longest playing hits max and pam wmbt Chicago's got the Super Bowl shuffle, but right here in Peoria, you just never know is creeping up the charts. And here it is, theme song for the Bradley Braves, You Just Never Know. basketball has a tradition of excitement. In the 1950s, the Braves made three NCAA appearances and twice they advanced to the final. A decade later, Bradley took its show to Broadway, New York's Madison Square Garden to be more precise, where the Braves captured a pair of NIT crowns in 1960 and again in 64. Bradley also suffered through a dry spell. Between 1968 and 78, they finished no higher than second in the conference. That was in 1974. Bradley was in need of a change, a change in the form of a new coach. They decided to take a chance by hiring a charismatic, take-charge guy with no previous major college coaching experience. Jimmy! Greg! Don't make up your mind what you're going to do. Go back to the perimeter. See, what I want to do is I want to get those long arms up and then make them throw out of that trap. So he'll throw a high His name is Dick Versace, and he's the or portrait a of a self-made coach. See, the, see Lenny? I've always been a guy that never had the silver spoon. I did not play college basketball. I was never a star. 
Uh, I read 200 theory books to learn how to coach. I did cinemagraphic studies of the jump shot so I could teach it. And then I took 15 years of my life to have a shot. And Bradley gave me the shot. And it was a major job. It was a reclamation project. But Bradley's reclamation was swift. Within two years, an NCAA bid. And then in 1982, an NIT championship for a team that, despite winning its conference title, was completely ignored by the NCAA. In retrospect, it may have worked out to our advantage. We might have uh, won a couple games in the NCAA tournaments, but we might have lost our first game in the NCAA tournament and, and, uh, and would never have had the publicity and the recognition we got by going to the NIT. Don't turn the ball over, okay? You're playing great. Playing great is an understatement. For Saces Aces are 31-2, and two, including a 22-game winning streak, which was the longest in the nation. I'm having fun. I just, you know, I draw up a play, it goes, it comes to life. You know, I used to draw up plays, and then uh, we couldn't uh, remember it out to the timeline. When I first came here, he told me that, uh, you know, he was plotting and planning a team that, that was going to make, uh, you know, a national run and put Bradley back on the map. Versace, he's Bradley's Leonardo da Vinci. Bradley's renaissance is a reflection of the player's faith in Versace. The coach has taught his disciples that no matter what the odds, you just never know. Jimmy Les tossing on the inbound. One second remaining now for Bradley. Here's the baseball feed into they're trying to get the tip up by Hawkins. Oh, yes! Does it count? I think so. I think so. Hawk with eight, rolls down the lane with seven, scoops it up with six, makes it with five, with four, with three, with two. Yes, Can't put the lane to back. They didn't call a timeout. The game's over. Yes, indeed. Hawkins hits the shot, oh. and we dodge the bullet again. Braves are led by senior guard Jim Les. He's the quarterback, and the man who finishes the plays is their leading scorer, sophomore Hersey Hawkins. Together, they form one of the country's best backcourts and certainly the most underrated. Now, here's a team that's had a remarkable season, winning the regular season Missouri Valley Conference title, cracking the nation's top 20, yet, for some reason, I still get the feeling something's missing. No respect, no respect. I honestly feel that uh, Bradley, probably in the Atlantic Coast Conference, would finish seventh or eighth. Bradley gets no respect. They have that electricity going, and you can see that by just looking at Dick and seeing how his hair is wired up. No respect! No respect! No respect! Bradley's got a great chance of sneaking in and beating people, and no one will ever know. Skeptics say Bradley did not play any top 20 schools this year, but the Braves did manage some impressive wins. We played um, Marquette in Dayton, and we played some very good teams. We played Tulsa, Tulsa, and all these teams were undefeated at their home court when we played them, and we were able to win all those games. Anytime you go on the road and win, I don't care if you're playing Laterno Tech, uh, that's quite an accomplishment. Think about not letting it end, please. I don't want it to end. I want to coach you a long time. And Versace's Braves don't want it to end either. They realize that this, their first NCAA tournament in six years, is their best chance to earn some of the national respect they feel they deserve. We don't want to go into the NCAA and lose our first game. You know, I think then that'll make us probably the laughing stock of the country. Just because, you know, everyone's going to say, well, you guys really haven't played anybody. You're, you'll have a, you have this glamorous record and, uh, what have you really shown us? Uh, I think we have something to prove when we get into the tournament. You just never know. You just never know! We'll find out where the 64 teams are headed later today at the top of the hour. Dick Schultz telling us that the field has been selected, but we do not know where those teams are going. Coming up next here on CBS, of course, is the NBA, and we will return live at 6 o'clock. We'll see you then, everybody. So long.